In this video, we'll talk briefly about Haemophilus influenza. This will probably be a quick video, and there's just a few high yield things that you need to know, which I will really harp on. First, H. influenza's defining characteristics are that it is a gram-negative cacobacillus. It grows on chocolate agar, which is sort of high yield because examiners like you to know that in order for H. influenza to grow, it requires hemolytic factors, and specifically it requires V factor or NAD and X factor or hematin. So you can either grow it on chocolate agar or you can grow it in the presence of Staph aureus and the Staph aureus itself being hemolytic will create those factors that the H influenza needs to grow. So first high yield point is that you should know that it grows on chocolate agar because chocolate agar contains those hemolytic factors, but you should also know that if you can't grow it on chocolate agar, you can simply grow it in the presence of Staph aureus because Staph aureus is a substitute that in and of itself will produce those hemolytic factors. That does show up on exam, so please know that. H. influenza colonizes the nasopharynx. It is transmitted via aerosolized transmission. Unencapsulated strains are the most common cause of infection. Now, to be clear, there are both unencapsulated strains and capsulated strains. If you've watched the previous video on Neisseria, then we already talked about OPSI and how asplenic patients are really at risk of infection with encapsulated bacteria, and H. influenza is one of those encapsulated bacteria. But since the introduction of the vaccine against H. influenza, those capsulated strains have pretty much been eradicated, and therefore the majority of infections are caused by the unencapsulated strains, which the vaccine does not prevent against. Lastly, H. influenza is a facultative anaerobe, and it is non-modal. Little cool aside here, this doesn't show up on exams, of course, but the reason that this is called H. influenza is because this bacteria was actually discovered in the late 1800s during an influenza pandemic. And the person that discovered it thought that this was the bacteria that caused the common flu. And that's why this bacteria retained the name influenza in the name. So pretty cool aside, you might impress somebody if you tell them that. Here's an image of H. influenza. Again, the thing that I want to call your attention to is that it is a gram-negative cacobacillus. So keep that in mind. Virulence factors, if you've watched the recent video that I posted on Neisseria, this really isn't a big surprise because it's similar. So first we have IgA protease. And recall that IgA is very important for immunity and defense at mucosal surfaces. So bacteria that have an IgA protease and can cleave that defense basically are going to cause infections at mucosal surfaces. And as you'll see on the next slide, H. influenza causes epiglottitis, otitis media, sinusitis, pneumonia, basically upper respiratory infections and it gets in at those mucosal surfaces. That's what IgA protease is doing. The more high yield thing, and just like we talked about in the Neisseria video, is the presence of a polysaccharide capsule. This causes concern for patients who don't have a spleen or are functionally asplenic. Again, we're concerned about OPSI, overwhelming post splenectomy infection. The polysaccharide capsule, and I'm repeating myself, so if you've watched the Neisseria video, you've already heard this, but it's very, very high yield, and please see that video for a full pathophysiological explanation, but the polysaccharide capsule allows the bacteria to evade the two-step process of opsonization and phagocytosis. And so in patients with no spleen who don't have those splenic macrophages, this bacteria can cause an invasive and overwhelming infection. Now let's talk about the clinical features. As I've already touched on, there are really two types here. One, there are your mucosal surface infections. So the IgA protease in the bacteria is allowing it to infect the epiglottis, the meninges, the ear, the upper respiratory system. So this causes sinusitis, pneumonia, otitis media, meningitis, and epiglottitis. Okay, so that's what you want to keep in mind for mucosal infections. And after somebody's infected with a mucosal infection, the infection, the infection can become invasive. So it can spread to other areas of the body. This is really um, less common, so it's not something that I would necessarily look for on your exam. But just know that with any infection, once there's a mucosal surface infection, that obviously has the ability to spread.
Now, the big thing that I want to call your attention to, and probably the most high yield part of this video is epiglottitis. Now, epiglottitis is going to be caused by H influenza if it's happening on your exam. And the way that they're going to give this to you is they're going to give you a presentation of epiglottitis and expect you to then connect it to the causative bacteria. So how I've seen this come up is that they're going to describe epiglottitis to you and then ask you what is the causative bacteria, the answer obviously being H influenza. But in order to get that third order question correct, you obviously need to know what epiglottitis looks like. So let's talk about that now. Epiglottitis is extremely high yield on exams because it's got a lot of very distinct clinical features and it also has a very famous imaging finding. Now let's start with symptoms. So you're going to see fever, you're going to see drooling because epiglottitis means inflammation in the epiglottis. So with that being so inflamed, you're not able to swallow properly. So we're going to see drooling. We're going to see dysphagia and muffled voice because imagine that suddenly in the back of your throat, your epiglottis is now hugely inflamed. You're obviously not going to be able to phonate like you normally do. We're going to see both strider and respiratory retractions because now suddenly with an inflamed epiglottis, we can't move air as efficiently as we previously could. And the highest yield clinical symptom that I want to call your attention to because it shows up on exams all the time is what's referred to as the tripod position. So usually on your exam, this is going to be in a child and they're going to be sitting up on their hands, usually with their tongue out and their head forward. This is a position that the patient will automatically assume because they are trying to make it more comfortable for themselves to breathe and to be able to communicate, but mostly to breathe. And so this is called the tripod position. And so if you're taking your exam and they describe the way that somebody is sitting, specifically in a child or adolescent patient, the bells need to be ringing in your head that they're trying to tell you this patient has epiglottitis. So again, this is referred to as the tripod position. Maybe they'll show you a picture, but more likely they're going to just describe it to you. So sitting up on their hands, tongue usually protracted or out a little bit, head bent forward. That's the tripod position. It's just a position that's more comfortable to be in if you've got an inflamed epiglottis. Now they could describe these symptoms to you and chances are they will, but they also could just show you imaging. If you see what's known as a thumbprint sign, you want to be thinking epiglottitis. And how this will look is you're gonna get a lateral x-ray as you see here in this image, and because of the inflammation in the epiglottis, it looks like a thumb. Now, please go ahead and Google thumbprint sign so you can see various images of what this looks like because it's a very characteristic finding. You want to know thumbprint sign equals epiglottitis. But something that's really important for test taking purposes is if you have a child patient in your vignette who has fever and some respiratory symptoms and they show you imaging, if you have absolutely no idea what you're looking at and you're not sure what the diagnosis is or what the causative agent is, you probably want to immediately narrow your differential to either epiglottitis or croup. And the reason that I say that is because epiglottitis has the characteristic thumbprint sign and croup has the characteristic steeple sign. So in a child patient with fever, respiratory symptoms, and some type of imaging in your question, even if you have absolutely no idea what you're looking at, I would always be guessing either epiglottitis or croup because they wouldn't be giving you any imaging if it wasn't either a thumbprint sign or a steeple sign. So that's just a little test taking strategy. You have a 50% chance of getting the question correct if you approach it like how I just said. Lastly, if you're taking step two or step three, they could take this one step further and ask you what is the most immediate next step or you know what's the appropriate um, which of the following is the most appropriate immediate action to take and if it's epiglottitis chances are the question is going to ask you this and the answer will be endotracheal intubation because in somebody who has epiglottitis you want to protect their airway before you progress with further treatment now speaking of treatment let's conclude by talking about how you treat h influenza the treatment in the mucosal infections will be amoxicillin plus clavulanate, okay? But if the patient has meningitis, then you add in ceftriaxone. And lastly, for close contacts, you need to give them prophylactic rifampin. So there's three different answers here. It depends on the type of infection, right? Either amoxicillin plus clavulanic acid in the mucosal infections or ceftriaxone in your meningitis patients. And then lastly, if they ask you what to give to the close contacts of somebody who has H influenza, the answer is rifampin.